Welcome to a history of Manitowish Waters and Russ Lake, an historic tour of the Manitowish Waters downtown area. This presentation will follow from what is now County W and Highway 51 all the way through town, following the yellow arrows, to what is the junction of K and W. This presentation is a replacement for a Zoom recording that didn't work for us on December 16th. So I'm filling in with this screencast, and I hope you enjoy this presentation by Jim Bokern of the downtown of Manitowish Waters. As we move on, early in the history of our town, railroads brought many individuals to Manitowish Waters, and meeting the railroads were shopkeepers and guides who would bring stagecoaches or wagons to pick up guests, ultimately bringing them to launches. If we look at the map from 1900, we can see here at the town of Manitwish, you would take the road right along the Manitwish River all the way to the crossroads at Rest Lake little over seven miles, and there's a very famous launch right here, right across of, uh, from Aurora Borealis today, where many people boarded launches to move to their desired destination or resort. In the 1920s, things changed rather dramatically. Automobiles became popular, and slowly motorists and the freedom of having your own vehicle overtook the railroads. The railroad sustained heavy business into uh, the period after World War II, but automobiles became the new standard for Northwoods travel shortly. If we take a look at Highway 10 and Highway 51 back in the day, they were just sand areas with gravel, maybe a little bit of pit run, and you were at your own danger and needed to be prepared for anything when traveling down these roads and trying to access the North Woods. We're going to move on now and take a look at downtown Manitowish Waters. This is a 1937 image here, and you can see that the main shopping area is blank. You have Hanson's Hardware right here, the 3030 Lodge right here, and um, Caldwell Banker, which was the uh, first LaPorte grocery store right here. And of course, what would be Winmore or the Pea Patch there. And this is Joe Ilge's resort that was on uh, Rest Lake and also an Indian camp. So we'll be visiting all those areas and the businesses along the way. Here's a modern aerial photo. So you can see how we have filled in quite a bit since 1937 and grown as a community. As we take our turn off of Highway 51. What we're going to be able to see is on the left, this giant hill. Well, at least in the 50s and 60s. Today, it's a quarry right over here. And that's where a lot of aggregate has gone for building roads and uh, concrete foundations and alike. That hill, if you could impose it over it, is shown right here below. Family members gathered from all over the community to come and downhill ski with a rope tow that went up this side and they even had gates for slalom courses. This was called Lake Lenore Ski Hill and was very popular. So as you come down County W entering into town, hopefully you'll see that quarry and have a whole different view of its importance. As we started to enter in town on the right, we find that Patterson Lumber Company started to build a small um, lumber service based on their lack to flambeau business. They came to the region, had a lot of acquaintances in the area, and Patterson was then sold to Timberwolf, and today it is Pukal Building. As we move just a little bit further down the road, we come to 3030 Lodge and 3030 Road. Behind what is the hardware store today, and just on the lakefront of Vance Lake, 
First, Bill and Val Mel built the 3030 Lodge. It was a classic resort. It had a famous smorgasbord, and it was mentioned that the internal parts of 3030 Lodge was also an old trapper's cabin that was actually built into the bar. 3030 was a very popular uh, location and went through changes and went to the Hughes family. And at first it ran as a traditional uh, cocktail lounge, American European plan kind of a resort where people came and dined. But later on, it became an exotic topless entertainment destination. If you've ever gone to the Pea Patch Bar, you can see this photo right here with Misty Nice. And uh, she performed with other of uh, her profession at the 3030 Lodge. Demand was so great, we were actually advertising in the Capital Times to bring some of those go-go dancers from down south right here to Mantrish Waters. This kind of exotic entertainment was actually rather short-lived, but uh, weighs heavily on the minds of some still today. If we go out a little bit further, we can see that there's Hanson's Hardware, right in the place where the True Value um, Hardware store is. And Hanson's Hardware started with a gas pump and uh, a place where you could get your hardware needs. This was one of the earliest businesses in the downtown Manitowish Waters area. As we look at old greeting cards here on the right, and from the old Chamber of Commerce flyers, Hanson's Hardware uh, greeted many of the visitors to Manitowish Waters as they entered the town's limits. Now, right across the street from Hanson's Hardware was the old postal service, the old post office. I remember this well. You see the double doors and the double windows, and you still see that in the structure of the nines. This is a repurposed building, and uh, many of us have great recollections of walking in there on the hardwood floors and uh, taking care of our mailing and getting important packages. As we move back across the street, a small mall uh, owned by the Hansons was expanded. Today we see the artist palette there and the post office. The wine barn came a bit later, but it was the village clothing shop and Bennett Floors and other businesses operated within this uh, space. Patterson Lumber Company actually had their administrative buildings on uh, the hardware side of the street while the lumber yard operated where uh, Pukal still is today. In 1947, George Laporte moved his grocery to its current location at uh, where the village market at Triggs is. He moved just up from the dam and built this fine brick building, as you can see here, with some of the older uh, automobiles of the time in front of it. It was quite a improvement of space and marketing for the community of Manitowish Waters. We can see in the upper right, they had a liquor store, we had the supermarket, and a whole host of other uh, businesses, including soda fountains and clothing store. Yeager's Resort Shop provided outstanding clothing for those visiting the area and residents as well. Marie Laporte's Village Soda Grill and Maletsky's Barbershop rounded out the Laporte shopping area. Sadly, the Laporte's grocery store burned down on June 30th, 1971. It'll take a whole year for the store to be rebuilt. The loss of this iconic store was truly saddening to many residents in Manitowish Waters. <clears throat> but new possibilities come in the following year and the new Laporte supermarket was established with a soda grill and Winter's clothing store. And once again, Laporte's was back in operation with Lakeland State Bank over on the far right. Across the road from Laporte's, 
is the ox yoke, currently occupied by the nines. The ox yoke was a fun place to go for all sorts of antiques and those kind of tourist items that folks seek out on rainy days. The barrel out in front right here always read wild Alaskan bats. And I fell for it every time and looked in. And inside were two small red wiffle ball bats. It was kind of a running joke for this property. Just down the road from the lodge was a large resort run by Joe Ilch right here on Rest Lake looking out toward Fox Island. Actually, right next to Ilge's property is the oldest known business documented for the community of Manitowish Waters. It was an Indian camp. And Outers Magazine in 1980 talked about this camp for outfitting where you could buy whole provisions or just a bucket of minnows. Whatever you needed, it was available for you right here. This camp was likely run by the Divine family, who were the first settlers in Manitouish waters. On the Ilge property, starting in 1917, Joe Ilge will build a large tent area for his family, looking at Fox Island. The Ilges will ultimately grow this property to include a sprawling resort. Using tamarack logs taken from Circle Lily Swamp, Ilge Lodge and cabins and outbuildings were a signature on Russ Lake. As you return from the Ilge property and head back down Ilge Road to the town of Manitowish Waters and County W, there was Seppala's Cottage. Seppala was a guide, and he was also the dam tender. His guiding exploits were well sung throughout the area, and he was a road troller, trolling spoons quite often with his clients. Tending the dam, he had the ill fortune of falling not once but twice into the water and over the side of the dam and out the other side. I think if we take a look at that drop and that really challenging swim, um, Mr. Seppler probably needed to be a little more cautious. He was also a trapper, and you see his beaver rounds all here hung out in front of his property. And many of the early pioneers would take to trapping in the winter to augment their incomes. Now, looking toward the Rest Lake Dam, we're going to do another big overview of the development of downtown Manitowish waters. We're going to start right over here where Caldwell Banker is looking at reports and go all the way down to the dam. And this is really the hub where the town began in. On the left, you can see Rudy's Rest Haven and the Northern Lights Hotel on the other side of the dam. So we're beginning right here at Caldwell Banker. And as you look at Caldwell Banker, that was actually George Laporte's first grocery store. And if you've been in Laporte's or the Village Market, you can see this picture of big George Laporte standing in front of his store as an iconic merchant within the early days of Manitowish Waters. Laporte also was an active beaver trapper, as you can see here, adding to the income of his family and still participated in guiding as a very uh, successful guide that uh, pleased his clients well. Once Laporte moves in 1947, the store that is now Caldwell Banker becomes Tony and Cleo's Variety Store. Again, you can see the gas pumps here with internal combustion engines for outboard motors and automobiles and lawnmowers and such, gasoline was in big demand. But here on the left, you see the bright 
shiny trinkets. And I remember as a young man going in there with the money that I had saved up to go and find all sorts of exciting toys and adventure items that I could take out and use along the chain. Across the street is the Rest Haven. First, it's Schroeder's Rest Haven, and it operated for some time before it was moved, moved to the List family, famous Rudy's Rest Haven. Rudy and Garnett List operated this. We see the classic image of the bar, and in the middle of the bar, when I was a young man, there was an unmistakable feature, a minor bird that could wolf whistle and talk aloud. I was mesmerized. Its name was Joe. And we are very interested in anybody who has a picture of Joe or any of these items of interest to send her to the Manchwish Waters Historical Society so we can just take a picture of them and then put them online and share them with folks in presentations such as this. Down by Kohler Park, there were gas pumps, Sinclair Gas with the big dinosaur, and you could pull up and get your marina service from the lists as well. Following the list, Eric's Bavarian Inn and Schwanberg's Bavarian Inn featured German food and were quite popular in town. More recently, Parkside and soon Manny's will round out the businesses that operated at Schrader's and Rudy's Rest Haven. Moving down toward the dam area at the location of the pea patch currently, we see this panoramic vision of the early Mississippi River logging camp. It also was the Chippewa Lumber and Boom logging camp, all part of the Weyerhaeuser conglomerate of logging interests within the North Woods. You can see the Dingle in the far ground um, as the cook shack and the bunkhouse as well as the blacksmith shop. At the top is a close-up of the dingle itself in 1904 and this was the hub of the town and really directed much of the identity of what will become Manitowish Waters. Shortly after the end of the logging era, Winnie and Marie created their famous bar that started as a humble birch pole tent with canvas over the top. They would then sell different items from this locale starting in 1924. Winifred Young and Marie Zimmerman will operate this growing business for decades. To the right, you can see on the east side of what is now County W, an expansive Winmar establishment complete with gas pumps. The Winmar on the left continued to grow and you can see the Northern Lights Hotel in the far background across the dam and will be a signature of what is becoming the downtown part of Manitowish Waters. And even across the road to the west, the development of Winmar properties with cabins and other accommodations sprung up. 1924 is going to mark the centennial for the Winmar or today the Pea Patch, and I'm sure that Barry and Lisa Hopkins are going to put together the appropriate festivities to celebrate this great landmark. Sadly, the Winmar will burn down and will move then across the road to its current location, first as the Blue Spruce as part of Dick Hill's operation of the business, and then quickly migrating to most famously to Charlie and Inez Pease, who called it the Windmar to begin with, but then ran it for decades as the Pea Patch, the name it still holds today. The Deckers then become proprietors of the Pea Patch. Um, to the right, you can see in a chamber magazine their sense of humor as they spoof the community by saying warm beer, lousy food, inverted and cold coffee. Uh, the Decker's operation of the Pea Patch will then transition to Captain Mikey's Pea Patch and then ultimately 
Judy and Jerry Schmidt will buy the pea patch and add the large motel to the property as it exists today. Sadly, Jerry Schmidt was killed in an automobile accident in the mid-1980s, and Judy will later remarry Bud Arnold, and they will together run the pea patch until, of course, it was sold to Lisa and Barry Hopkins, who operate it today. Across the street, we see the rod and reel sporting goods. Uh, it replaces the Windmar on the Kohler Park side, or the east side of County W. The rod and reel will be in place for decades, providing all sorts of services around sporting goods needs with a particular focus on fishermen. Shortly after the 1880s, the first government sponsored dam was created on Russ Lake. The dam is what really creates the focus of the chain and the focus of the downtown. Initially, the dam was going to be built over here at the outlet of Vance Lake, not where it currently is here on the outlet of Rest Lake. We can see in the early Army Corps of Engineers that proposed dam at Vance Lake is very, very clear. And they did a lot of analysis in 1878. And you can see a red line where a 25-foot head dam, which they were going to put up, would have actually raised the chain of lakes. Manage which water chain would have been remarkably bigger if this dam would have been commissioned. But it wasn't commissioned, as you see with the red X here. By 1880, they move it to the spot where it currently is, where it could be built without the expansive dike and earthen works to hold back the water, and the rest is history. The landmark for what becomes the community of Manitowish waters is established, and it defines, first, the logging era. We have two old pictures of the Manitowish Dam, both looking upstream. This one is looking up with these famous kind of small gates, and a small dam head here. So we're below the dam looking up toward the lake. That was taken in 1899. Here to the right, you can see glass nitro-based slides showing the same gates and the operation of the sluice here, much smaller. You might say that building can't be on the correct side of the river, and it is likely when this picture was taken, these glass slides were reversed, thus putting that building and that hill on the wrong side of the river. These kinds of photographic errors are common with nitro-based slides. From the photo from 1899, we see Peter Vance's business, his Riverside House that operated in 1903 before it burned down. We don't know the location of that today, and we'd be interested from anybody who views this uh, screencast if you could share with us your idea where it's located, that would be really helpful. Reach out to the Manitowish Waters Historical Society. In 1901, a new dam was built, and this was for an important log drive being run by Weyerhaeuser and his Chippewa Lumber and Boom and Mississippi River Logging Company. Here you can see all the timbers are super straight. The sluice is running hard, and folks are on top of the dam with much larger gates than witnessed before. We see from researching in newspapers.com, 1901 was targeted as being the part of a 75 million foot of standing timber lumber drive starting in the Manitowish Waters region. Imagine the parties that must have gone on with 150 men ready to drive as river rats these logs down the mighty Manitowish River with a new head of water as high as 16 feet pushing these logs downstream. Here we see in 1905 they say the dam was a big one holding back hundreds of square miles of water at a 12 to 16 foot head. Very impressive and again defining the River Drive logging era of white pine. By the 1920s, the dam was replaced with a concrete structure and it operates very similar um, to the way it does today. Beneath the dam, we have several unique features to the town of Manitowish Waters. One will be the first municipal fish hatchery in the state of Wisconsin. The second being the first successful fishway 
in the state of Wisconsin, all in the area of the Rustlake Dam and the downtown. As always, if you have any images of the development of the fishway, the hatchery, the dam, Rudy's Rest Haven, or any historic element, please share that with the Mantwish Waters Historical Society. We would just want to scan it and put it online to share with others and add to our presentations. We really get a big bounce out of our outreach to the community when these new documents and images are shared. And I have some updates for you now, so let's get to them. First of all, the town of Spider Lake had only 102 voters at the time, but we commissioned a thousand dollar expenditure for the building of this great fish hatchery, the first municipal fish hatchery. And again, a cost of $1,000 from the taxpayer at Russ Lake. This will be a progressive effort, a combined local and government uh, operation for improving the fisheries and the management of fish in the area. In 1932, the first municipal fish hatchery, Spider Lake, was proudly displayed in Wisconsin Conservation uh, publications. Many other municipalities will follow with their own specialized dam following the lead of Manitowish Waters. Here's a picture, and it's interesting because we were officially the town of Spider Lake until 1940, and during the operation of most of the fish hatchery, but at the top of it, it was the Manitowish Waters Fish Hatchery. So again, our identity in the downtown area is very evident. And here you see the fish hatchery just after it was built. The interior of the fish hatchery actually has a lot of insights as well. You see the gentleman here who would be working could be a local or a Wisconsin Conservation Commission uh, leader. But look at all the jars filled with eggs ready to produce the fry and the fry would be re uh, held in the holding tanks. And this was all part of the genius of this fish hatchery. At about the same time as the development of the fish hatchery, the bar fish lock or a fish ladder will be installed at the Rust Lake Dam. You can see it being built right here next to the dam. And it's really an elevator that has a chamber within the cement area region that allowed the fish to move up into the other side of the dam. It was felt that the fish had difficulty moving up the dam and it, inf and it hurt the spawning possibilities for game fish. So just like the fish hatchery, the fish lock was an aggressive attempt to try and facilitate sustained fishing in the Manitowish Waters area. We actually have a diagram of the fish lock and how it operates, as well as these great pictures. The fish lock itself had a timing mechanism that you see on the left. As it fills with water, it lifts a gate from uh, beneath at the lower side of the dam toward the pea patch, and the fish follow the flowing water. The fish enter this chamber the chamber based on the water driven uh, gauge here on the left with the yellow arrow will fill this um, container of water, this rectangle, and the fish swim out the top. We actually have a brand new fish lock donation from the Bar Fish Lock in Ironwood, Michigan. Here it is right here with the viewing window to watch the fish in the chamber. Here's John Hansen man handling that as we got it into the garages for the Manitowish Waters Town Hall. And it is hopefully going to be displayed soon in uh, an area in Manitowish Waters. This is uh, really quite exciting to have an artifact that is unique to this area that was defining um, to the management of fisheries. If we take a look at aerial photos, you can see the chamber right here with the orange arrow that would fill. The water would come in based on that uh, water-driven timing mechanism. And then the fish would migrate underneath and come out here on the top in this uh, rectangular square. Here, fight nets were loaded in, these hoop nets, to actually capture the fish and then count how many fish actually came through the fish lock. This was a staged event. Look at all the people in town out there in the rain. They have their umbrellas out watching this ceremonial christening of the bar fish lock in 
downtown Manitowish waters. Here's a, a little remnant of the, the Windmar also uh, for your viewing. Across the way, we see the beginning of the Northern Lights, Zigray Northern Lights, and the development of a great hotel complex right here, as well as the Northern Lights on the other side of County W. Here's an aerial view. You can see later on around Dietz's and other areas, there's, there's even more development. But we're going to focus on this stretch of Manitowish waters for the next little bit. Remember, from Manitowish, 7.25 miles will take you right here to this great landing. This is from the 1900 Bucks Resort, and it shows how the town was a hub right here next to the dam. And at the landing, you can see all sorts of supplies up here on the right being stacked, as well as supplies being stacked here at the deck. And we have a launch operating right here, bringing these guests, I'm sure, to the resort of their choice. This was the paddle wheel that dragged um, logs either to the dam right behind this um, for river driving or to railroad uh, hoist to be hoist on railroad cars. Please note the cutover in the back here and how very few trees were left at those early days on Rest Lake. Again, the paddle wheel right here being the signature, but you see the horse, the wagon, and the ramps here with another launch. Again, more launches, canoes. So this was a hub activity, uh, getting to Manitowish Waters, getting to Rest Lake, and getting to your destination through the launches. Zigray's Northern Lights Resort will follow afterwards, solid uh, block, uh, fireproofed. It created a large campus, as you can see right here, as, as well as with the um, Northern Lights bar behind that. Uh, pay attention to that. That will become important uh, quite quickly here in the presentation. And of course, here's our fish hatchery in operation as well. The sprawling campus looking up from Rest Lake and looking down over the lake. Notice how that peninsula is all filled in. Since the earlier images that I showed you of the landing and the cutover. This also was the site of the Manitowish Water Skiing Skeeters, the Voss family allowed the, and Zigray families, allowed the skiing skeeters to perform um, up and down the show course. This will run from 1961 to 1987. Here we can see different uh, individuals who have been in the ski club. This is uh, from the 60s here. We have board members of uh, Kay Kranz and Jody Miller right here, or Jody Brenner. And we have Barb Bartling or Barb Laporte right here. Again, marking different decades of skiing skeeter activities along the downtown area. Now we were talking about across the road at the bar, which is now the Aurora Borealis or AB. And we have had some insights from our crack researcher, Kate Kranz, and she found out about a shooting, a gunfight at this locale at the soft drink parlor. Uh, it seems that these soft drink parlors were often a front for moonshining operations in illegal liquor trade. Mr. Oscar Hankey was leaving at 11 o'clock at night from his soda shop and authorities say men opened fire on him and struck him three times. This was a mysterious event. As we look at the article more closely, the authorities, however, are puzzled because of the fact that the men opened fire immediately without first attempting to rob their victim. Certainly, moonshining and extra legal activities were very much present in the Northwoods and the Manitowish Waters area, and this gunfight is an alarming reminder that very much Manitowish Waters still had its Wild West traditions underway. Over time, we see that the Northern Lights Bar will be run, and it will also operate as the Pine Barrens and Aurora Borealis. We really need pictures of George's Keep Smiling In that was also on this site, 
and one of poor Henry's when Henry Voss uh, ran a business at the same locale. So please send that to the Manitowish Waters Historical Society if you have those in one of your scrapbooks, because we need it. Um, as we move up the road to what is uh, the Schmidt House uh, Realty, uh, this actually was a dry cleaner and the home of Aldolf uh, Mazzetti, who was a uh, police officer uh, for the county. His wife, Vi, operated a commercial laundry in that space, and it was an important part of the downtown as we moved to the outskirts through County W. But it wasn't the outskirts for very long because Art Ells started a hub of business with his service station in the location of Dietz's. It will be right where Tower Road joins County W. Bob Dietz will then take over and operate and the Dietz family still operates with Bill, uh, the service station there at the corner of W and Tower Road. Kind of neat pictures here showing wintertime and summertime operations. The early, one of the earliest buildings in the downtown area was built in 1912, and that was the Rest Lake Ranger Station. This was one of four satellite ranger stations from the headquarters in Trout Lake. Here's the ranger, Randall Kruger, walking up what will be Tower Road with his ranger cabin, bunkhouses, barns, and a windmill fire tower, 50 feet high. That's just a windmill structure underneath and they customized a cab to go on the top. This telephone pole ran to the base where people would spot, rangers would spot the fires up above, they'd run down and they would phone it out to Trout Lake so they could have a coordinated response to try to foil the terrible forest fires that had ravaged the North Woods. We'll see that the ranger station at Ross Lake was so popular, it was actually featured in Wisconsin Conservation Corps magazines, but its existence was actually rather short-lived because of a restructuring of uh, fire suppression and the Wisconsin Conservation Commission taking over the Department of Forestry. But in 1915, the ranger station was also used as the State House School or the Rest Lake School, and they actually leased these properties. The school will operate there for some time. Some buildings will be removed. And then in this really neat picture we shared on Facebook, here is the first business for the Tower Inn. If you zoom in right here, it says the Tower Inn. And this green building that is on the outside of Anglers today was actually the first structure. If you look real close, there's actually a goat in the back of this Rambler. So when you would go on vacation, it was important, I guess, to bring a goat. The gas pumps were also there, and this was the post office, too. Um, Michelle from Anglers uh, and Paul Habram shared with me that they demoed this building, and in the interior of the building, they found some old glass panes with women's names on them and colorful uh, images inscribed. It seems that at some point, this structure may have also been used uh, for temporary and close quarter housing for groups of young women, uh, possibly expanding the famous trade from Hurley down to the Manitowish Waters area. If you look at the Tower Tea Room, it was built in 1927 and it's next to the green building here. Again, here's the context of the first building, the tower in here with the goat in the back. But then the tower tea room was added. It was called a tea room because it was during Prohibition. But as we have covered before, uh, Prohibition uh, enforcement was lax and oftentimes many establishments no longer uh, followed the Volstead Act and its enforcement. So you can tell that this was before 1934 because we still have a windmill fire tower to the left rather than the uh, large fire tower that was put up by the CCC in 1933 and 1934. Speaking of which, here's the new fire tower that the CCC boys put in. Prohibition's over. We call it a bar. We call it a resort. And today it's anglers, and it operates right there. 
little color change, but the old Tower Inn is still operational over time and an iconic architectural structure for our community. The Tower Tea Room, looking back the other way, again, has gas pumps and different entry levels, but the signature fireplace is the same. Later, it's going to be back to its original name, the Tower Inn, when it was run by Ken and Pat, and it would then be later run as the fireplace and uh, changing waves and then again as anglers as it operates today but it's still focused around the uh, the tower and the fire tower itself if you climb up the hill you can still see the big massive footings for the ccc building tower that held uh the lookout tower up for so many years Across the street in the Bay on Rust Lake, we have the beginning of the Minels. Minels Resort was famous. There was also a Minel Resort on Turtle Lakes, and they operated uh, for decades, providing great services in that bay along County W and on Rust Lake. Bull Khan did a lot of work, too, at that time. He was a famous guide. He uh, was featured in the book Musky Fever, but before we had pontoon cruises and before um, the Discovery Center and the Mattrich Waters Historical Society would take you out on these kind of historic tours, there's Bull Khan starting the uh, traditions well, well before what we do today. And it's a beautiful view of that same back bay looking at Camp Jorn here and the um, eastern edge of Fox Island. Just up the shoreline, Gus Heidemann, who is the caretaker for Charlie Nash, the owner of Nash Motors, our American Motors, and what's now Camp Jorn, operated as Oak Grove Cottages, which provided a lot of amenities and great resort accommodations along the shore of Rest Lake. As we move a little further up County W today, we will see the North Lakeland Discovery Center entrance, which was actually first created for the first Wisconsin Youth Conservation Corps, or the YCC. The first YCC camp created by Gaylord Nelson, governor of Wisconsin and founder of Earth Day, wanted to create a Civilian Conservation Corps-like experience for high school youth. And this was in operation from 1962 until the 1990s. It is called State House Lake because of the YCC experience. And here is a model of the new building and construction at the North Lakeland Discovery Center, where they still keep many of the YCC traditions together and have numerous interpretive signs that are being put on site to celebrate this unique tradition of environmentalism that is based right here in Manitowish Waters, Wisconsin. If you go up just a little bit up the road and stay on the left-hand side, one of the greatest generational experiences was celebrated by many families throughout the year, especially though in the summer. You can see it, it's the old town dump and from this map advertising Manitowish Waters, you can see the turn off here from W. You go down to the Gar Bear Raj pit, and indeed the bears were there. We have a lot of great bear photos, and people would actually let the bears get a little bit too close to their automobiles. But I remember as a little boy going there in my pajamas and watching people uh, roll down the windows of their car and push food through the windows and the bears would come and eat off the side of their vehicles. It was fabulous and fascinating. And if you have any good bear dump pictures to share with the Manitowish Waters Historical Society, we'd love to scan them and share them with others. Moving across County W to what is now Rest Lake Park, we'll find that Rest Lake Park, which was really developed in the mid 1980s, initially on the left, was part of state property. It was actually part of a state lease. And in the area around Vance and Rest Lake and throughout the downtown, these yellow arrows show one, two, three locations where state leases were provided 
on uh, properties and individuals for as little as maybe $20 a year could lease land and put up their um, cabins and alike. The Hoosier Club, was, as you see marked here in 1918, was already under operation from the state leases where folks from Indiana and other places had a small enclave here of cottages. Today, there are still residents of Manitouish Waters whose family came up during this period, occupied the Hoosier Club property, and were heartbroken when the state of Wisconsin started shutting down these leases in the 1960s. Here we see from 1976 a plea to the governor of Wisconsin to actually have the lease extended. The leases were extended over here by Serban Park until uh, about 10, day, 10 years ago. But uh, the Hoosier Club and the areas around Rust Lake Park will all be taken in uh, the 70s. Today, Rust Lake Park, a lease site, Serban Park, a lease site, and the Vance Lake Campsite, a lease site, all are public access points that are celebrated as go-to destinations in Manitowish Waters, Wisconsin. In a land exchange done with the town and the DNR, the Manitowish Waters skiing skeeters moved from across uh, from Aurora Borealis in 1988, though the skiing skeeters worked diligently from 1985 to 1988 to prep the property. The property has gone through many changes and iterations and now um, is blessed with a beautiful pavilion provided by the Uline family that really makes Rust Lake Park and Skeeter Beach one of the great Northwoods destinations. We're nearing the end of our trip through the downtown and here we have an aerial photograph. So we're gonna move across Rat Creek here, take a time to look at Campbell's Resort and we'll look at the Oasis and what was developed in that area and McElroan's gas station. And here we go. Here's a modern example of the development along there. And much of the focus will be right here at where K and W come together. Campbell's Resort uh, ran for quite a while and was in that northernmost bay, as many resorts were just before you get to Rice Creek and just past Rat Creek. Many stumps in that area provided outstanding fishing and moving just out into the lake, you would have the benefits of a deep lake like Rust Lake for the guests who would go to Campbell's Resort. Today, this property is owned by the Keelers and it stands out as a large building close to the shore. Moving up through town where the Yellow Arrow is right here across from County K was McElroan's Texaco Service Station. John and Helen McElroan uh, were the proprietors of this service station. We're lacking images of this, but we do have a picture of a young Jim Cagney with an afro who worked for uh, John McElroan for many, many years. Um, Jim Cagney has shared with us many of the insights that he had, really respected John and the way he conducted business, how John really put his customers first, worked cooperatively uh, with Bob Dietz, and uh, they would actually share equipment uh, between one another to bring a better quality of service to the different summer residents and year-long residents in the Manitouish Waters area. Right across from McElroan's service station was the location of the Oasis Bar and today's Smokies. But before these iconic restaurants were in place, there was actually a logging camp that was set on that property. You can see the image of the logging camp in operation here. We received that from the Keith family from Big Lake. They took this picture. It is a classic. We have a sled being pulled by horses. Uh, with uh, a regular uh, camp building, blacksmith shop, corral, gentleman carrying a gun. Um, in a recent interview that uh, Kay Crowns has uh, conducted, there was discussion how a bar was also fashioned into this logging camp 
in, around the period of 1914. So we're still learning more and more about this crossroads at the end of what is Manitouish Waters, Wisconsin. But uh, the story goes on from here, to be sure. The Oasis operates for many years and um, was iconic as a log bar with great service in food and a north woods feel. At the top of the peak of the roof here, many first-time archers would come in to celebrate and drink at the Oasis and fire their kill arrow into the peak just below the roof of the building. And like a porcupine, those arrows would protrude. Unfortunately, this log cabin icon in 1993 will burn to the ground. Here you can see it fully engulfed with the Manitouish Waters Fire Company doing their best to contain the fire and protect the buildings within the area. It marked the end of an era of the Oasis Bar and that very historic corner at the end of downtown Manitouish Waters. So we say farewell to the Oasis and are coming to the end of our presentation. We've taken you on a tour along this yellow line from County W when we were looking at the ski hill right at this juncture and just concluded at Smokies or at the Oasis. It's quite a journey with quite a heritage. We hope you enjoyed this presentation that is a replacement for a Zoom presentation conducted in December of 2021. Please stay tuned for more Zoom presentations and YouTube videos brought to you by the Manitowish Waters Historical Society.